Welcome to the Spa Girls podcast, the self-publishing podcast for authors. You're in the right place for the best writing, marketing and publishing advice, plus interviews with industry experts and best-selling authors. I'm Cheryl Brooks. I'm Shah Barrett. I'm Wendy Valor. And I'm Trudy J. Welcome to the Spa Welcome. for another week. This week we have an awesome guest. We've got Alessandra Torre. Hey, Hello. Alessandra. Welcome, Welcome back. <laughs> Yes, welcome back. Welcome to the spa and welcome back to the spa. Um, This week we're going to have an awesome talk um, with Alessandra on making books addictive, which I can't wait for. I'm really excited about. Um, But first I'm going to read the bio for anyone who's been hiding under a rock and doesn't know who she is and has Mm -hmm. never heard of Inca's Con. Um, And then we will get right into things. So a New York Times, USA Today and Wall Street Journal bestselling author Alessandra Torre has written 23 novels, including multiple New York Times bestsellers. She is also the creator of Alessandra Torre Inc., an author's community and online school with over 20,000 members. She is the founder of Inca's Con, an annual author conference. A self-publishing advocate, Alessandra speaks frequently to universities, conventions and author groups, and we're delighted to welcome her back to the spa. Um, Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so so this topic of of making books addictive sounds awesome <laughs> yeah. yeah we should all do with us yeah. okay. but but let's talk so we had you on the podcast in um what did we say april 2020 i think mm-hmm. um and i just <laughs> want to know what you've been doing since then like give us a little bit of an update on where you're oh at my and... God. Uh, <laughs> so, much. so many things. so much <laughs> I haven't, I say I haven't been doing much. I feel like I haven't been accomplishing much. Um, my life is basically um, Inker's Con, which is an annual conference for authors, but we kind of have stuff throughout the year. So it keeps me very, very busy. Um, and then I work with a tech startup that uses artificial intelligence on the editorial and book discovery side of things. Um, and that's called Authors AI. And then I write. So um, I'm down to one book a year right now which is really scary for me because um, in my heyday, I was writing four books a year, three to four books a year. Um, so I'm down to one book here right, right now. So it's really important that my one book does well and my backlist does well. And thankfully, um, readers have kind of kept that going and have have kept that up. And so I was recently trying to figure out like, oh, what topic am I going to talk about at this year? Thinkers Con and what topic, you know, is something I feel confident when speaking on because I've been kind of out of the marketing game. Like I've been so busy on these other things that I've really neglected my own books. Um, and so craft, I was like, oh, I could talk, I could talk about craft. And so I really kind of dove down into what it is I think readers like about my books. Um, and when I look at my reviews, kind of like, and it's an interesting exercise. Any author can go to their books or anybody's books and just see uh, on the Amazon page, like what are the most used words in the review? And that'll show up like in those little boxes. And for me, it was like page turning, page turning came up a lot and twist and turns came up a lot. So that was um, what I decided to really focus on more recently was kind of putting together, figuring out what, what creates a page turning book. And if, if a reader like picks up a book and just can't put it down, why, what is it about that plot or that storytelling style that keeps that reader continually engaged. So um, that's what I'm hoping to talk to you guys about today. Yeah, love it. That's awesome. So, Mm. so that's interesting though. So you've got these two page turner and twist and turns. So Mm. how did you kind Mm. of then go, what is it like, where do you look to your book to figure out where it is? Like how that's it. Like, where did you go next? Well, that page turning twist and turns was a lot easier because I was like, okay, well, I, I do that intentionally, right? Like I'm continually working on my twist and turns and it's something I've gotten a lot better with, uh, being deceptive in my writing. I've gotten a lot better at, as I've, you know, book one, you know, versus book 30. Um, so twist and turns was easier for me. It was more like how, do I, and I recently did like a webinar on this, how do I explain a twist and turn? Like, I know how I create twist and turns, like how would I teach that to like another author? So that was a little bit harder. And page turning, um, it it really took me diving into the reviews to say, okay, what it, what, why is this book page turning? Um, And what are the elements that make it? So I kind of boiled it down to four what I call essential elements that makes a book page turning. And that that did take some kind of research and then some dissecting sort of a, my own writing and my own style. And every every author, every writer is different. But for me, I've I kind of honed it down to four things. And 
what are those four things? <laughs> what are those four things? <laughs> I just jump in. I can talk. I mean, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to dominate. You, you the talk. No, you no. talk. So if you're good, then I, you yeah, have the floor. Yes. All right. I'll jump right in. So first thing is suspense is creating suspense and maintaining suspense in your book. And suspense doesn't mean like, um, danger, you know, necessarily, or a murder or any, any element of danger. It's not that when I say suspense, what I'm talking about is creating questions questions in your reader's mind and then holding them in suspense not giving them those answers for a period of time um so that's really and so you can create that in any type of any type of book it doesn't have to be a romantic suspense or any type mm -hmm. of suspense novel um so there are the traditional suspense examples what happened to the missing girl who killed this person who is you know stalking yeah. this individual and why but when you look at non suspense novels or non-mystery thriller novels then the elements of suspense could be like okay why do these two characters hate each other or what happened in this character's backstory to make him be like this like when you look at um a man called ove um if even if you haven't read that or, or seen that movie like from the beginning you're like something's going on to make this character be this way like what is it so that's a suspenseful element and you have to watch i mean the only way you're going to find out is if you watch the entire you know most yeah, of the yeah. movie read the book you know read the majority of the book so um why did every, why does everyone seem to hate this couple why is this character ignoring her mother's calls or you know all of those sort of things and if you yeah. immediately vomit that information or immediately share that information right away then Assistance. You have removed a reason for that reader to continue reading. Doesn't mean that they won't continue reading, but you've you've removed that element of suspense. So, yeah. um, so I think of it kind of as being like the fuel in your book's engine. It's kind of mm -hmm. what keeps that reader like moving forward. And hopefully, there you are also creating an enjoyable experience, you know, and all of these other things. But it is really that gas. Um, and your suspense can be big questions and little questions. Mm -hmm. And um, so the big question, you know, like, is this couple going to find a happy ever after? The little question, you know, who's knocking on the door in the middle of the night? Um, some questions are going to be answered right away, you know, like in the next scene or in the next few scenes. Other questions, they're going to have to read the entire book before they find out. Mm -hmm. um, so and I like to do I like to deliver my answers to those questions kind of I like to spread them out through the book and I mm -hmm. think of them as kind of like breadcrumbs right like it's that encouragement it's my little gift or my little reward for the reader like good job you've read another eight chapters here is a gift you know because <laughs> yeah if you raise a bunch of questions and then you make them wait 30,000 words to deliver mm -hmm. anything at some point some readers are just going to give up yeah, you know, yeah, they're just gonna, yeah. or they're going to not be able to keep track of all of these questions in their head and they're and they're going to move on to something else. You have a, that I as a reader, I'm a very quick do not finisher. I will drop a book like that. Other readers aren't like that. But so this is really talking about not those readers. That once they start a book, they're going to finish no matter what. I'm really talking about that that group of readers that will put down a book, you know. Um, so you have so multiple questions. Sense. So you'd have yeah, multiple no questions problem. and some big, some small, like there might be an overarching question, but like yeah. the other little ones sprinkled through and you would do it like at a, like you wouldn't answer all the questions in chapter three or something. You'd like sprinkle them through. Is that right? Sprinkle them through. Yeah. And continually be introducing new questions. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't introduce all of the questions right at the beginning because again, the reader will lose track of them or forget them, Yeah. but also continually raising new questions where the reader is like, Oh, like every time you kind of raise a new question, the reader kind of sits up in their seat and pays a little bit more attention. Mm. You know, it's it's like kind of poking, you know. It, I attended this uh, youth religious conference when I was in middle school and the speaker would say, occasionally he would stop talking, he'd say, listen. And he'd be like, are you listening? And when he said, listen the first time, I wasn't really listening, right? And even mm. when he said like, listen, like I wouldn't really start listening. It wasn't until he said the second time, like, are you listening? That I was like, oh yeah, I am listening. <laughs> 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 but you know, you start like thinking about yeah. other stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. 
And I kind of think with my books, the same thing. Like sometimes I'm like tapping on, yeah, like, on yeah. <laughs> like, like, yeah, like, Hey, if you don't pay attention, you're going to miss something, yeah, you know? Yeah. So, so yeah. sometimes you throw something and, you know, mm-hmm. and learning how to introduce questions does take some practice. You know, it's not, you know, you're not just blatantly if writing the question, you know, like it, you know, it's, you have to, to do things that cause the reader to go, wait a minute, that's odd. Why did that happen? Yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. then, and there, a them might look, yeah, yeah. as a reader, you, you, you get that hit of satisfaction. Yeah. When yeah. Something is resolved or, or the breadcrumbs lead to something and you're going, oh yeah. 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 That That's a great <laughs> moment, isn't it? And I think yeah. you can give that as a, as a writer then, yeah, you're doing well. <laughs> Keeping them thinking. Yeah. Do you plan it before you start, or is it just something that, like, you write the first draft and then kind of go back and make sure it's there? I don't plan it before I start, and I am a pantser. But like just today, I'm ten thousand words into a book, and just today I wrote. Um, let me pull it up to see how I did it because I had a lot of things going on in this book, and so I wrote. Um, I wrote a list of. I I wrote things to reveal to the reader. And then I have like seven things that I need to reveal to the reader at some point. Mm -hmm. And I do want to make sure. So what my next step that I'm going to do is I'm going to get this big giant piece of paper, like legal size at minimum, but I like to get like the big, big old like drawing paper. Mm -hmm. And then I like to kind of just draw out my plot line. And then Ah. I put kind of where I'm going to reveal certain things. Yeah. And then a lot of times I'll just draw like, different scenes that kind of and I see like okay like halfway through the book is when I need to reveal Mm -hmm. this Mm -hmm. thing so if I'm at 45,000 words and I'm not anywhere close to revealing that thing that I'm like oh I like you know I gotta I gotta speed this up a little bit so Mm -hmm. I will do that um even though I don't really know how I'm gonna get to that reveal I know that like okay around this point in the book I should be I I haven't I haven't I haven't shared anything to the reader in a while so yeah. it's, it's time for me to yeah nice. that wow that's, oh. that's a great that's way that idea yeah. yeah with the the thing yeah 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 Working okay out. cool mm. all right we ready for number, number two, two. Ooh, yes, yes we are this one's quicker um and that is just tight writing and what i'm calling tight writing is like no fluff no wasted scenes every scene has a purpose and it's yeah. not like bogged down with long-winded backstories info dumps or just unnecessary detail so it's it's me just making sure that the plot is continually moving forward and I'm not giving them you know I'm not boring them in the process (laughs) and I I have to say this doesn't work for all literary styles or all writers so some genres um literary fiction does have maybe longer scenes with more description um, I try to find like the juiciest, most exciting, most important part of a scene. And I use that. And if the scene doesn't have a juicy or interesting moment, like, is it something I can nix? Mm-hmm. And sometimes during the writing process, I write those scenes and then I just nix them, you know, in my edits, but, um, it's very controlled of you to nix mm-hmm. the, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love deleting things like in, my I'm also a pantser so I am very used to the fact that I went in some tangent that then didn't lead anywhere and mm, so yeah. but in my normal edits I'll I'll delete 15 to 20,000 words so uh, I yeah. I I almost love deleting I love deleting things so <laughs> I never delete delete them they always go somewhere and maybe yeah. one day I'll do something with them but yeah, yeah. I'm a deleter Big so how do you know well. it's tight writing like how if you're a, a new to writing and you're gonna well Alessandra told me to do tight writing what <laughs> where do you where do you go in and cut like what's some of the things that you like you, you're talking about sort of scenes but also words well or, yeah like... so I my personal like um my personal rule of thumb is I write short chapters so my chapters are between 500 and 2000 words and that's also just a, something I hear read mentioned all the time like oh this book had short chapters I flew through it you know and the best example of this is if you pick up a James Patterson book just gonna say it's a James Patterson every literally like one one to two pages and you're the next chapter like it's crazy but it's I mean he packs the punch like Mm -hmm. you know it's it's interesting 
So if I find that I have a, a scene or a ch- that's going longer than 2000 words, then I ask myself why like yeah. is, and sometimes it's a hundred percent warranted. So I, I think of my scenes as I like to think I, I use food a lot in my examples. <laughs> so I think of my scenes as like, sometimes you have potato chip scenes and potato chip scenes are short and they're salty and they taste good and they fit your desire to eat something right then and then you know and you're done with it in five minutes and then you have like casseroles right scenes that need like some time and wait and you know to be savored and enjoyed and it's going to take you 45 minutes to make that thing and then people are going to eat it and they're going to sit around talk or whatever and then you have scenes that are like feast I mean that are like Thanksgiving dinner I'm not sure what you know yeah Christmas Christmas dinner here right that you have spent days planning and you know people dang well better sit there for four hours and you're gonna eat leftovers for five days you know so (laughs) When you think of like Game of Thrones, like the Red Wedding, which even if you haven't read the book, I haven't read the book. I don't have the patience to read that book, but I loved the show. The Red Wedding is like such a huge, iconic, amazing, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. memorable. If someone thinks back, like the one scene they're going to remember from your book, that typically is a feast scene. And a feast scene is going to be longer because you're going to have, if you try to write the wedding as a potato chip scene, you know, you, it would Mm -hmm lose all enjoyment like it just would wouldn't have that impact so a lot of scenes need build there are typically a big scene in your book that's going to need build up and people and the reader's going to need to be smelling the air and you know like really absorbed in that atmosphere and have description and have inner narrative and you know it might be an action scene it's typically oftentimes a climactic scene but it could also be like the meet cute or something like that if it's a big moment but it's that it's kind of um this year inkers con and s johnson talked about screenwriting she talked about like trailer scenes like the five scenes you have that are going to make the trailer like it's that type of scene so so sometimes you need space and you need to dive in, but you don't need to do that with every scene. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I try to limit those feast scenes. In some books, I don't even have a feast scene. Um, so it's not like you have to have a feast scene in your book, but I, if I have one, I don't, I typically only have one or two depending on the length of the book. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Nice. That makes sense actually. Fantastic. Yeah. Can all I right. just ask a couple of silly questions? I just I just realized I need to contextualize all this for, for maybe for our listeners. So what are the genre that you're writing? How how long do your books tend to be? And are they standalone or are they series? Yeah, great questions. Standalones, psychological thrillers, or domestic suspense is my genre. Yeah. I now I say that I've written 20 some romance novels, but really like with what I've written in the last four years and what I'm pulling from for the purpose of this conversation is really focused on my, you know, more recent writing, which has mm-hmm. been psychological domestic suspense. They're typically 90,000 words. Did I miss a question? No, no, so no, no you in, 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 and they're all standalones, obviously. And they're, standalones. And they're all standalones. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. That's good. That just gives me the kind of, sorry, I yeah. personally love the sound of a feast scene. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's the best description <laughs> I've had of that, of <laughs> how to kind of differentiate those scenes. That's awesome. So, so we, we're not going to have five feast scenes in a book unless it's a really, really big fantasy but you know yeah like unless but literary fiction probably maybe could um and like sci-fi fantasy a lot of those have longer scenes because they have more world building you know and that's one of the things that it's all about kind of your genre and what your genre enjoys and you in if your genre enjoys descriptions and you know or i don't know like war scenes or something like that and Mm -hmm. you are trying to follow this advice to the T and write short chapters and everything like you're going to disappoint them so it's really it does depend on but I would think with any genre what is important is variation in scenes and so I'll do potato chip scenes like when you look at my kind of scene link that oftentimes is people listening can't see my fingers but oftentimes (laughs) it's it it varies Mm -hmm. you know so um, and that that mixes up the pace and that gives the reader some you know Mm -hmm. variation Yeah. yeah And that's good, isn't it? Um, the variation. So I should imagine these things have come over time too. It's natural to you now just to write like that. But I mean, right. it's not, it's something you've developed, isn't it, over time? But to start with for newbies, it's a great way to sort of uh, gauge for them to start with. I mean, I love the 
the feast scene and stuff like that. I mean, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And I think too. And also, also letting them. Know. Sorry, you go. No. I was just saying, also letting them know it's okay if a scene, like if you've only written 300 words and you accomplish what you need to accomplish, like totally mm. fine. Mm. Page break, start a new scene. Like, don't feel like you have to just fill it up with 1,500 more words of filler. Yeah, so yeah. We have a 2,000 word paragraph. <laughs> I mean, exactly uh, what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah exactly. Get to the end of your chapter, and it's and it doesn't seem long enough, but if it everything's matter. in there, mm -hmm. it is. Yeah, yeah. So, exactly do right. you have one scene per chapter? Is that or a, um, you wouldn't have multiple scenes I, in a chapter? I normally have one scene per chapter. I'd say, a, mm -hmm. unless I'm um, like a character is doing something, and then there's like a time break. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I just yeah, yeah, time. yeah. Um, but it's still kind of that same activity. A lot of times I'll keep that in the same yeah. chapter, yeah. but I definitely start a fresh chapter every time I change point of view mm. or typically location. So I, my books, like I have books with 135 chapters. Mm. Um, so, and I have books, I remember I told my formatter, I'm like, I'm really sorry. I really tried to like reduce like the number of chapters because he was creating unique stylized chapters. I think like the lowest I got was like 70. And that was the, you know, my shortest <laughs> yeah. uh, number of chapters, but yeah. Wow. Oh, well, I mean, if, if it works, it and works, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I definitely think shorter chapters makes it feel fast paced. Like that yeah. is something I've seen and done over the time so mm. that's mm. is there anything more to add about the um that the typewriting typewriting no yeah. well and it kind of leads into the next which is vivid scenes um and those two almost seem to contradict each other but you can write really vivid scenes with still maintaining tight writing um and so but um so vivid scenes are created with interesting details settings and characters um, and oftentimes it's not all three. Oftentimes it's just, you know, interesting details or an interesting location or you have an interesting character. So um, every scene doesn't have to be a, a, you know, a vivid scene, but you do want to have like a, a collection of trailer scenes, like scenes that really stand out in a reader's mind. They really felt like they were there and, you know, experienced like those tra trailer worthy scenes that Anas Johnson um talked about and so um just making sure that you do and and I always get asked well okay well how do you write vivid scenes without you know bogging the reader down with descriptions and it's really just making sure you're picking um I combine a lot of description and action so my I try to allow my characters to interact with their settings so I'm not just describing what the restaurant looked like you know I'm having her like um, straight in her silverware on the linen tablecloth or something mm -hmm. like that so that yeah. it is both showing her and her interaction or he's just like you know kicking a dirty you know mcdonald or an empty mcdonald's cup out of his the bottom of his floorboard you know when he gets mm. in the car yeah. like that right there tells you a lot about that person mm. this car you know what i mean yeah. like I don't have to describe anything more than that. Like they understand that this car is a disaster zone and this guy, instead of reaching out and picking up the cup is just going to move it out of the way. So, yeah. um, so just trying to kind of be unique with, um, with your descriptions and with what you choose to describe, but also not, not overdoing it. You don't need three different things to tell someone that you're in, you know, yeah. a certain situation. Oftentimes you can just pick one. Yeah. yeah. Nice. I like that because sometimes you read a book and the and the author hasn't gone into the head of the character and the and everything is being described as if it's not like surface kind yeah, of like yeah, surface yeah. versus actually going right into the head of the character and looking at stuff from the perspective of the character. And I think that's an important part. When you're talking about vivid scenes, that's something that really gets you into the head of the character and lets you know what's happening around. Yeah. yeah. And I, yeah, those are that's a good. Uh, do you what do you think about using like these the the um usual advice to use the senses like smell and taste and touch and things like that? Are you is that something you're trying to do or is it more just? I don't do it. Um, I don't do it intentionally, but I do try to use. But I don't use all of the senses in the same scene. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, like if someone walks into a morgue, I will like use like what I would consider the most intense sense that will be experienced, which is smell, yeah. you know, and how a morgue smells, which is a very unique 
not great smell, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so a lot of times I will, um, or if it is like a love scene, then I will use a lot of senses. So it's not just touch, 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 you know? Um, so if there is like a fit, very physical scene, then I'll go into more, but I do try to, to limit, I, I try to vary the senses, but I try to limit, um, too many in one go. Yeah. 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 Overkill on them. Yeah. yeah. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so you're talking about, you said interesting details, settings, or characters. So are you trying to make the settings unique and different rather than setting it in the same place? Like, what do you do there for the settings? Um, so there, um, it, I don't, I don't go out of my way, but I do oftentimes create variety. So, and a lot of times with this, I'm thinking also of movies and with movies and TV shows, every time I talk to, um, anyone in Hollywood, it's always like, okay, how can we, especially right now where so many things are going to series versus standalone movies, it's like, okay, how can we make this world bigger? You know? And a lot of times when we look at kind of my new, my, my new, like the first books I wrote, everything was kind of in three places, right? I was always like, my characters were always eating <laughs> or, you know, or they were like at her house or they were at the coffee shop. And it was like those three places, like that was it. Yeah. Um, so so I do try to think where, you know, if, if there is a unique place or if we can put them in a different situation or we can give them the reader more of an experience, especially if you're writing genres where, you know, if you're writing a fantasy and you're creating this cool unique world and again then you're still using the same three locations everywhere you know like give give the reader you know a chance to enjoy this world that you're creating mm -hmm. for them yeah, yeah yeah and oftentimes especially if it's like small town romance uh, or just a lot of times the environment itself can be almost its own character um and interacting with that so even if what you're creating is just a really cool quirky bookstore you know that it that makes an appearance several times or the town itself which has its own you know personality whether it's hospitable or whether it's hostile you know like you know that's just kind of keeping in mind that the setting itself oftentimes can be a character you know yeah. um mm -hmm. and you don't want just a bland vanilla this book could exist in any city you know, or this story could exist in any city in any any environment. Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean the character, the, the setting always has to be a character, but a lot of times if your um, character's life is kind of drab and her storyline isn't, you know, maybe is more of a normal story time with that, you can always add some drama from the world around her. Yeah. But you can yeah. you can do things like just as you're talking, I'm thinking like you could use setting to like someone having an argument, but they're in the back pew of the church on a Sunday morning and the yeah. the preacher's up the front and they have to whisper the argument and people keep mm -hmm. turning around and telling yeah. them to shush or or they're in the middle so of the lake there, yeah. and they're out fishing and they get into an argument or something and there's nowhere Neither for either of them, them to go <laughs> yeah. and they have to yeah. I don't know, push right each idea. other out if they yeah. kind of, or one of them jumps off and swims back, whatever. But you know, there's things like that that you can kind of mm -hmm. use to add to the scene or to the interaction between the two people that yeah that is just the I love that example like and it's the same thing like someone ripping their pants when they're at the house doesn't matter but if they're okay. ripping it at a job interview with the mm -hmm. guy that they've had a crush on for whatever else you know what I mean yeah. and or that's the place where you know they have a panic attack or something like that right it's it can completely change um the conflict and the and ups the ante, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah, up the ante. Yeah. 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 I love okay. it. Cool. And so details and characters. So do you work on your characters to make them more interesting or do they like is there things that you kind of use to amp them up? Well, I'm bad because my character is always extremely unlikable. Um, and that is something I read review, I read a lot of reviews, and I'm really like, okay, my new goal is to create one likable character <laughs> per book. That's no one will goal. read the book. It's, no one will read the likable character book. <laughs> I'm like, you know, and a lot of times end up killing the one likable character, but um <laughs> what does that so say I'm, about you psychologically? A hundred percent. Um so I don't know that I'm the best person to give advice on characters. Um, but I do uh 
and this kind of goes into twists and turns, like the more I love characters keep secrets. So mm -hmm. my characters are always keeping secrets, like typically from the reader, but a lot, you know, from whatever, and they're lying and whatever. So, um, so I've always just found the, um, I always found the, the worst side of people, the more interesting side. Right. Um, and it works in my genre, but, um, mm -hmm. but I really, I don't, I think there are a lot of better people than me that could talk about characters because I don't know. I just create horrible, horrible people. And <laughs> but that's interesting in itself. Are they, yeah. are they people, do people feel like they're redeemable characters? Is it something like house, like that television series yeah, house where he was this yeah. horrible, horrible guy mm -hmm. who actually solved but all you the. You like him. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. like him. And you know, horrible. despite yourself, you like and him. I love house, <laughs> you know, are they that kind of character yeah. or are they just well, horrible? No. I think some of them are because um, I remember the, the third book I ever wrote was about a girl. Uh, it's a series now. It's called The Girl in 60 Series or the Deanna Madden series. And um, she was like a girl who hadn't left her apartment in three years because she wanted to kill people. Like thoroughly enjoyed the idea, had killed someone before. Like uh, that's all she thought about. She wanted to kill oh people. But she was trying to be, trying to not kill people. So she had locked herself in, never left her apartment for any reason. <laughs> and um, so I was pitching this story to my agent. She's like, I just don't think people were going to want to read it. <laughs> Well, somebody who wants to kill people like she kept trying to justify it somehow I'm like no no she just likes to kill people <laughs> like like you know um but that book was like people love <laughs> this character like the series like has a rabid fan base and I love this character like she's my spirit animal yeah. so um, <laughs> so I don't I think sometimes yes um but you think I about think the, another tv yes. series is Dexter he yeah. wants to kill well, people. That's what, and a lot of people, uh, yeah, associate, like, they called her Dexter in stilettos, because it's kind of uh -huh. the same. Like, we like Dexter, even though he is, you know, like, damaged in a his, lot of his, ways. His, his urges have been funneled into a yeah. semi-positive yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> but, okay but see so there is sort of there's a twist right so maybe that's where we that yeah. we talk about the twist in the yeah um, you've got to be able to empathize with a character don't you like yeah I think too sometimes. well i think you have to connect with them in some yeah, there way there has to be and, some way yeah and their actions have to make sense to you like yeah. even if you don't understand that character like yeah. you logically can see why they're making these decisions yeah if yeah. you have and one of the first things I learned from a traditional publisher editor was I had a character who was a, like a likable character. That was back when I wrote like likable characters, um, a likable character, but um, she had TSTL syndrome, which was a term that the editor used and it's too stupid to live. And she was <laughs> like, she, this girl, like, eavesdropped on something she shouldn't have found out something dangerous and then she's like running around causing trouble for this like mob family and she's like you know this what you're gonna have is where the reader's just like this i just don't even care about this character anymore like you went into the dark basement too many times you know yeah. something's <laughs> down there like why are you going down there yeah, yeah, so yeah i do think that's important that was i've never forgotten that lesson and yeah. so i tr so i do think it's important that the reader can at least understand or empathize with cer certain aspects of that character even if it's mm. just like the fact that they have anxiety or like that they have a horrible mother-in-law or something like that that you're like oh I also yeah. you know have a horrible mother-in-law or I don't yeah. but yeah. you know <laughs> yeah or I also really love my dog more than people you know yeah <laughs> so, yeah. 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 yeah yeah and I think yeah. you talk about the TSTL like if the character keeps making the same stupid decisions over and over again, right. people don't like that either. So that's yeah. that same thing. It's like, I see that in romance. I experience yeah. that as a reader of romance is where I'm yeah. like, like, I just, I just can't with this girl. Like, you know, yeah. like yeah. at this point, just have your heart broken. You deserve it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> Sharpen up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't make, keep making the same mistake. And we Come kind of on. expect that as readers and uh, is that something happens and they bad thing happened and then they don't they shouldn't do the same thing again because they no, should have learned they and then we want them to do something different and learn as they go throughout the book yeah. but yeah growth um <laughs> all righty what's we've got up to number three so we better keep going was yeah. there, there was a fourth so one wasn't there one last one yeah and that's i call it hops and cliffs and it's basically the idea that typically in a book at least in mystery thrillers but in a lot of books you should have multiple plot lines um and so it's not just, you know, this character trying to do this thing. It's also 
these other situations that are going on. And I typically have at least, I always have at least two, but sometimes I have three, sometimes four, but two or three plot lines in a book. And what I do to kind of create that page turning or that addictive quality is I will be in a plot line and I'm continuing along that plot line. And then once I get to the point where I'm about to give them a breadcrumb or I'm about to reveal something, or there's some sort of a cliffhanger moment at some point in time, that's when I then hop to the other plot line. Oh my God, you're and evil. I hang out in that evil, plot evil, line evil. for a period of time. And they have to read, they're forced to read through those, oh you know, God. those scenes um, until, until I jump back and I deliver them. So I leave them kind of hanging in suspense. And this, um, my kind of, it should always be like a real cliffy. It shouldn't be like, you know, someone runs in and they're like, this building is going to explode in five minutes you know and then like we've all got to get out of here and then you move to something else and then when you come back someone's like what do you mean the building and everyone's running she's like haha just kidding april fools like right there like readers gone right I, i'm gonna be like packing out my bag see ya. yeah so yeah. so don't like artificially create cliffhangers just to jump in between plot lines yeah but um that an example of this i had to book the ghost writer so i had three plot lines in that i had a a famous writer who was dying um i had a past event that she wanted to write her last book about so i had this past event that was unfolding which is like what ha really happened to her husband and child four years ago and then i had a reporter in present day who was trying to find out the truth and like you know digging in and messing up everything when this writer just wants to write her last story and die you know so mm -hmm. i ha had like these three like plot lines and jumping back and forth one kept the reader in suspense but what it also did is my my main plot line which was like this writer who was dying was very bleak like she's alone in her house she has no friends she's like terminal you know and it's just her writing her story and if I had stayed there for 90,000 words like the reader would have just yeah I mean they would have given up right yeah. or they would have <laughs> so Moved I on. could jump to lighter moments and mm -hmm you know, funny thing, like it wasn't appropriate necessarily to have like mm. a funny ha ha moment in this reader, but I could do it in other plot lines and yeah, I yeah. could implement danger and, you know, pressing and urgency and things like that. And the other plot lines that I couldn't necessarily create in my first. So anytime I would get kind of too far in one, then I would jump into another and you don't want to create whiplash. Like, like you don't want to jump back and forth so much that the reader isn't invested in anything that's happening. So I try to stay like three or four scenes in one before I move to another. The exception being like a lot of times I'll do where like there's a, a in Big Little Lies, a books by um, the Big Little Lies author does this really well where there's like a police investigation or something that's happening and you're just getting like a paragraph of it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. just a little bit of clue about something and then it's like okay now we're back to three days earlier you know and and yeah. the events leading up to that so that's what I call uh clip um clips and hops hops yeah. and clips, hops and clips. Yeah. 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 yeah so how would that work in a, like a romance novel would that be like the the two main well, depends well it could it be the two point of views right yeah. so it could be his and hers because they each have their own things going on in their life and some of those things are things that they're keeping from the other person and so you could like have an event and then you could jump into his point of view and you can see his reaction to that event or you know his reaction to something she did or something like that you could also have like typically in romantic suspense you'll have some subplot or some other person that is watching what's happening and meddling with it you know or a lot of times it could be like a third person point of view, just other events that are happening. So um, what I, it's hard because I, even from the very beginning, even though I wrote suspense, uh, wrote romance, I always had some sort of an element of suspense. But let me think about a book that had no suspense. So I had Hollywood Dirt, which had no suspense. And I had, um, you know, the female character who's living in South Georgia, minding her own business. And then we had a movie that was being put together in Hollywood. And you're seeing this like train wreck of an actor who's going through a divorce and everything that's happening in his life. And you're, and you're seeing the point right before their two storylines converge, you know? So for the first 25% of the book, it's kind of hopping back and forth between the two. Then Hollywood comes to this small town. She ends up being cast in the movie. And so suddenly their plot lines are more moving together 
but he's still dealing with stuff in Hollywood and you're, you can progress through the book kind of in their different heads. So mm -hmm. I can jump back and forth um, like that. Yeah. Okay. And then it gives them like, because you've got the two plot lines is this kind of often, I would imagine they'd be conflicting. You know what I mean? Like, right. That's it. Yeah. That they don't. Yeah. That, like that his bounce. impression of how their first date went, like, he's like, man, that was awesome. Like I nailed it in the sack. And she's like at, you know, lunch with her girlfriends. Like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to see that guy again. You know, so, <laughs> you know, awesome. <laughs> and, you know, or like a really, um, 10 things I hate about you, not 10 things I hate about you. Um, the Matthew McConaughey and Kate Hudson movie. Um, oh, oh, lose a guy, lose yeah. a guy, how lose a guy dies yeah. in 10 days. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. To perfection. Like yeah. she's trying her best to break them up. He's trying their best to keep them together. And you're kind of seeing their two worlds and they're painting a very different picture when they're yeah. together yeah. of each other, yeah. but you're getting to see their emotions when they're apart yeah. or yeah. their intentions. Yeah. 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 God, I love that movie. It was yeah. It's a great movie. I haven't seen that movie in a in a while. Yeah, now I just have to rewatch watch it now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those scenes where yeah. she's trying to be the worst possible girlfriend ever yeah, and like yeah. being clingy and, and, and bring around things to his house. Oh, that's funny. Anyway, and then yeah. he'd be like, see you on Friday. And he'd like the door shut. She'd be like, like, I yeah, what do I have to do here? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so is that that was the fourth thing, wasn't it? The hops and that's hops and cliffs. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so um, is that so? That's the main part of what you would do to make a, a book addictive. Are those the, the four areas that you would look at? Is there anything else that you need that people need to think about? Well, the before? other kind of uh, the other second half kind of of me like talking about the subject. So I'll just do the cliff notes version. Is twist and turns yeah. and and turns could is most is basically like when you boil it down to is the reader is expecting when they start a scene or, you know, a chapter or a book for some, for a logical conclusion to the scene, right? Yeah. So you have um, a couple that is, you know, breaking up and the logical conclusion is at the end of that scene, they will break up, right? Yeah. Or, or a couple's walking down the aisle and the logical conclusion is at the end of that scene, the couple's going to get married, right? And so what you aren't expecting is when like, they're about to say I do and the bride punches the groom in the face. Mm -hmm. Like, so that right there is, Oh, is is basically me saying like are you listening like right like mm -hmm. the, the reader is going to be like whoa like I was kind of dozing uh but now I'm paying attention and like mm -hmm. wait do I need to like read this scene again like what just happened mm -hmm. um and so uh I use turns a lot um for me in my creative process and my first drafts I don't always keep them but if I'm starting a scene and it's starting to feel like this book is getting kind of monotonous, and this is a lot of times in thrillers, they always just say like, when it's getting boring, throw a dead body in, right? Like <laughs> um, if if I, if it feels kind of like I'm like, eh, nothing's really happened in this book in a while, then a lot of times just as a mental exercise, I'll be like, okay, there is a logical conclusion to the end of this, end of this scene. What is something that the reader that, is unexpected like what is a way that someone will react or something that they will do that is unexpected and sometimes that leads to greatness and sometimes mm -hmm. it leads to something that is not going to work in the book and it makes absolutely no sense for the bride to punch the groom in the face you know yeah so um so a lot of times I'll just it's kind of like doing like that what if scenario like what if and then you just like word vomit 10 different things that could happen and um and sometimes like there's gold there. Like, and it doesn't have to be something that changes the entire plot of the story. It can just be something that you're like, whoa. And then it takes the characters kind of in a new direction for a period mm -hmm. of time before they, yeah. you know, find their way back to the, to the plot line. So, um, so those are, those are turns and then plot twists are the plot. Even me as a pantser, like I got to plan out my plot twist and plot twists. They either, cause the reader to look at the book in a completely new way. An example of that would be the sixth sense, right? Like mm. you had an already interesting story, like, oh, you have a kid that sees dead people. And then suddenly something happens and you're like, whoa, wait a minute. Like I need to rewatch this entire movie. Exactly. Because mm. I uh, like That's suddenly <laughs> you're like rethinking through everything, right? Like uh, fight club was the same way. Or you have a plot twist like Gone Girl, where you have an interesting story, you know, a wife has disappeared, husband probably killed her, but the, 
a logical conclusion to the end of that story is going to be either the husband's found guilty, someone else killed it, killed her, or, you know, maybe, you know, something else happened. So the readers going along, they're enjoying the story. And then something happens and you're like, wait, I have no idea how the story is going to end. Like, I, 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 I don't know, like mm. anything could happen right now. And so that, um, those plot, those plot twists are typically created by first creating, um, I have to remember people are listening. So first creating a storyline that is a false narrative. You're creating a story of what the reader thinks they are reading, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. That's storyline A. Storyline A is what the reader thinks they are reading. I think I'm reading a story about a kid who sees dead people, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have the actual storyline, which is the truth of what is happening. Mm -hmm. And so you create storyline A with... um point of views like deceptive point of views or you know selective point of views selective scenes and um just a second let me find my notes on this uh uh misdirection and carefully selected scenes right and then you have the what the story is actually about and you hide you intentionally hide that with also point of view misdirection and carefully selected scenarios and if you really want to be like plot twist 2.0 you create an additional story, potential storyline, which we'll call like storyline C. And that's what you are going to trick the reader who is looking for a plot twist. Mm. You're going to make them think that they have figured it out. And 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 you're going to give them some other scenario, like a potential of this called red herring. But we're talking about a little more advanced red herring, right? So it's, it's like the reader's looking for a plot twist. They're trying to figure out they can can tell you're hiding something or it and a lot of times the reader won't be able, like you'll have clueless readers that don't even understand that this is going on so they're not looking for anything but those really crafty readers you let them think that all of the reason for this is because of this other scenario mm -hmm. and then they're not even thinking about the the true scenario right and yeah. so it's how those that real that fake scenario or that fake narrative is interacting with the real narrative at certain points because you got it you do have to a perfect plot twist when it happens the reader goes oh my god hmm. you're right it was there the whole time hmm. and i it, you know and i didn't see it but there were clues like you know the the worst type of plot twist are ones where it's like no like yeah. uh, -uh yeah. like we're gonna fact check this like like this, this, and this, you know, like it's, there's no way that anyone could have figured this out because you just brought together yeah. two yeah. things that had no connection prior, mm -hmm. you know, or didn't make any sense. So, so I try to give, I, I try to make it so that if a reader rereads that book, they will see that you gave them, you gave them moments, mm -hmm. but you also gave them reasons that those moments were happening so that they didn't second guess it. Um, so that's, and I could talk about plot twists forever, but we're, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. We're going to have to have you back on to talk about yeah. plot twists. But for right now, I think we've come to the end of uh -huh. our time together. Yeah. Oh, unfortunately, yeah. so I could quick. honestly keep going for a much longer, Alessandra. That's yeah. fascinating. <laughs> um, and I've definitely learned or had you know i'm thinking three things of the, um for my own plotting now i think so. we all are yeah yeah, yeah yeah it's been awesome yeah um so if someone so we need to quickly mention inca's con a mm -hmm. and um and you've got some a free course is that right on sort of similar stuff or is that not really well, mm, sorry sorry I ate a Skittle at a horrible moment. Um, <laughs> is there a bad moment to eat a Skittle? I, don't think so. I do have, if someone's interested, I kind of really covered it, but I do have a free webinar on plot twists and turns. And I do dive into plot twists more. So if someone's interested, I'm happy to give you guys the link to the replay. Yeah. Um, if they're, if they're interested. Okay, I'm not well, sure. We'll, have, we'll put that oh. in the, in the show notes, yeah. maybe yeah. a link to that. If someone wants to go over it again. So let's talk. Yeah, so I'm going to be honest. I covered the majority of it. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. okay. So, I don't cool. know how interesting it would be. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, maybe uh, we'll see. Um. So let's talk about Inca's Con. So it's it's still going on, and it will be going on the last bit of it when we put this up, this episode. Yeah. So if someone wants to jump in and kind of do some of the last of the of the actual kind of roundtable live events, they can do that like 
as soon as they stop listening to this amazing podcast okay. um, episode. And but otherwise, they can still purchase it and listen to the recordings for for a wee while yet. Is that right? Yeah, a hundred percent. So Inker's Con is an indie fiction authors conference. It launches every year. So, and we have over half of our attendees join after the fact. So mm. um, the live interactive events will end August 10th. Um, but like I said, half of our attendees join after that date and they'd never know any different. So, yeah. um, so when you purchase a ticket to Inker's Con and I, um, and I believe y'all have a coupon for it, mm -hmm. um, yeah. when you purchase a ticket to Inker's Con, you get immediate access to the 30 main classes. We are actually adding one this week. So 31 main classes, and those are full length, actionable, no fluff presentations and writing marketing, advertising, and business, um, all designed for fiction indie authors. And then you also will get access to a dozen um, recorded Q&As with best-selling authors. Those are across all fiction, all major fiction genres, um, plus access to like 30 or 40 um, recorded roundtable discussions, which are on any topic, wide versus KU, Kickstarter for authors, Instagram for authors, um, just a copyright. All, I mean, there's just dozens of topics that are covered in those. And, and yeah, it would be great for you to sit there live when they're being recorded. But to be honest, um, you can, you can just binge them or you can, you have six years to watch them. So you can watch them yeah. whenever you want yeah. at a time that fits for you. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. And and actually, yeah, letting getting to watch them at a time that suits you and stopping and starting at them. a place of your, for example, you might do the craft stuff of your writing at the moment, then you're ready to market. So then yeah. you can do the marketing ones. And it's it's a great way of kind of drop feeding the information in. And also yeah. just as those that aren't in America really appreciate the, the yeah. uh, digital access. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. So we yeah, get... like selling direct is something I'm not interested in right now, but it is on my list of mm -hmm. like in the next years I would like so we have three or four different classes on selling direct um this year and so I'm I'm not even watching any of them now I'm just gonna I'm just gonna yeah. set them aside and when I'm ready then I'll then I'll yeah. binge on all of them on a Tuesday afternoon um and then be ready to go yeah yeah oh so if Excellent. you want to join or um what do Sign you call up. it Sign, sign up, up for sign up for, to, what's the word yeah. um for anchors con and you want 50 dollars off through our special link what is our mm. code is our code is spa girls and you go to anchors con dot com okay. <laughs> make sure i got my n's and my m's in the correct order there yeah <laughs> and if you sign up via our link, you get the Spa Girls book and a couple mm -hmm. of really awesome checklists. And our um, everlasting gratitude. And our so. everlasting gratitude mm. for, for signing up through awesome. our link. Awesome. And Trudy will come around and cook you dinner sometime. Yeah, yeah. and I'll oh, come around and cook you dinner. You don't want that. <laughs> yeah, you really don't want that. Like, honestly, I'm doing everything. Um, so, so, um, and, and just so they know, so when you go to inkerscon.com, there's a payment plan or a pay in full. The coupon will work, will work for either. Um, but when, when you click, you will create a username and password first, and then the next screen is where you'll enter the coupon code. So a lot of people are like, oh, I don't see it anywhere. So mm -hmm. it's, it's after you create an account. And if you already, if you purchase something in the past, you'll already have an account. So it'll yeah. probably just take you right into the place where the coupon is. Perfect. Perfect. That's awesome. Fantastic. So Thank that, that would be the much. best place to, to send people is just the inkerscon.com website. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't. We don't have customized links, so it's the coupon code is really important that y'all use the coupon code, and then we're happy to work yep. with you guys so that you can give any bonuses you want. Yeah, wonderful. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you so much. So that awesome. is fantastic. So if you do <sighs> sign up using our code, you need to come back to us for those bonus bonuses and yeah. tell us that you've done that. So yeah, okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Alessandra. Um, I we're running out of time, so we'll just sign off now. But if anyone wants to find out anything more about the Spa Girls, you find us at Spa Girls dot com and on all Bagus the socials podcast dot com yeah. yeah oh yes uh, yeah okay so i don't even know our, our website so i don't normally do that but so <laughs> no. anyway right. no you don't thank you thank for you. listening okay. and thank you thanks. for being here yeah. Yeah. thanks everyone for listening thanks to another all. episode see you bye, bye. bye.